Professor Mike Coppella, Chair of the Yale Council on African Studies and Co-Director of the Air African Initiative, faculty, students, and benefactors, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. It is a pleasure for me to be at Yale. And I thank the Macmillan Center for the invitation to speak with you today and for the warm welcome. It is often said that it is the special privilege of friends to speak frankly and openly to each other. And that's what I hope for here today. This week at the United Nations General Assembly, the focus has been on implementation of two major new agreements on sustainable development and climate change. These pacts are proof that the United Nations remains relevant. Of course, international institutions have their flaws. Rwanda knows this from its own experience. Nevertheless, the bias toward cooperation and dialogue in the multilateral system offers an alternative to zero sum power politics. That's why we in Rwanda are always happy to do our part. For example, as the world's fifth largest troop contributor to peacekeeping keeping operations. At the same time, there is a growing sense of pessimism about the international community's ability to deal with problems such as state collapse, violent extremism, and forced migration. Sometimes these efforts are not only ineffectual, they actually, seem, they actually seem to make the problems even worse. My purpose here today is to talk about what's wrong and how I think that can be addressed. The preservation of peace, security, and prosperity rests on a common vision for the future anchored in shared values. Yet, today, we are seeing the steady erosion of values-based solidarity, leading to real moral and ideological confusion and new instabilities, both within nations and in the mechanisms of international cooperation. Profound change has been underway, and the world order is shifting irreversibly. Democracy is not in a decline. But because of the levering effects of globalization, accelerated by the spread of technology and information, as well as the greater range of experiences and approaches that have been tested, we in the developing world have greater confidence to pursue the same ends in our own 
ways. We increasingly base our legitimacy on results achieved and the views of our citizens rather than on external validation. Some participants in the international systems tend to seek this or to see this shift as a challenge to their historical leadership. They continue to assert the right to define objectives and impose outcomes without meaningful consultation with those concerned. To justify that exceptionalism, action has to be justified in terms of moral responsibilities rather than narrow interests. Some countries simply expect to be trusted to work in the best interests of humanity as a whole. These two factors are contributing in important ways to the instability and uncertainty we face by the undermining, by undermining the value-based solidarity upon which the effectiveness of international cooperation has always depended. What is at risk, therefore, is the sense of a global community based on shared values, which the United States, Rwanda, and many others are equally committed to. By asserting the right to define legitimacy for everyone else, trust between countries is lost. Instability increases and countries are even pushed to make bad decisions. But one size does not fit all. The United States, for example, is huge. It may require impersonal and legalistic mechanisms to achieve adequate democratic consultation. In Rwanda, to take another example, we have the advantage that the relationship between citizens and leaders can unfold in a more direct and face-to-face -face manner. The mechanisms and processes may not look the same between two different countries, but the right question is whether the substantive outcomes are comparable in terms of the quality of civic engagement and the actual results achieved in the lives of the citizens. What matters is the value the system accords to each citizen and their ability to give input and get their concerns and ideas addressed. Nothing done against the wishes and expectations of citizens is sustainable. Supporting the persistence of this outdated norm that some can decide on behalf of others is a source of tension in international affairs. It's not right, and it doesn't work. Moreover, the manner in which decisions of war are arrived at is truly chilling at times, as if real people don't live in those places. It is better to work patiently 
to facilitate change in a society and build new consensus while containing negative effects rather than engage in a slash and burn democratization. We can't power gasoline on volatile situations, light a match, and hope that the fire will cleanse and renew. Countries are not national parks, and people are not trees. An inefficient state is better than no state at all because it offers the greater prospect for sustainable improvement and transformation. Yet, it often seems as though chaos and disorder are required in order to convince others of the legitimacy of a system of governance. It is important to step back and learn the lessons of the past eras of judgment and analysis. Unfortunately, there is little evidence that such introspection and course correction is taking place. This leaves a vector of instability in world affairs that is of increasing concern and danger to all of us. America and other major countries have the power to shape the world according to their designs. However, there is an additional power that comes from working respectfully with others and valuing the input and contributions of friends. When it comes to Africa especially, there is a great deal of continuity with certain negative assumptions, widely shared across governments, media, and academia, not only in this country, but more generally. Rwanda, for example, has experienced many contradictions in its relations with counterparts. Perceptions often loom larger than facts, and continued engagement is conditioned on accepting erroneous perceptions as true even when everyone involved agrees they are not. This is not diplomacy. It is a demand for submission. But Rwanda did not survive by giving in. If provoked, we prefer to stand our ground and defend what we know to be correct, even if there is a price to be paid. This is not just a, a reflex of pride. We just believe that being straightforward is the best course, especially among friends. After all, a willingness to obey is a poor predictor of reliability or virtue. Submission produces clients, but not partners. It is normal for countries, whether large or small, to pursue their interests. Let me give an example from the recent decision to phase out the sale of used clothing in our region of East Africa. This measure aims to build 
our manufacturing base and also importantly to fight the mindset that we are people who should generally be satisfied with the second hand things. But as we know, for example, United States strongly supports industrial development in Africa through programs such as the African Growth and Opportunity Act. Yet we have learned that there is some concern about our policy change because it is beneficial to some people here in some ways. So why don't we find a way to work together instead so we maintain a good policy which we all agree to is beneficial while finding a way to create new opportunities for these American farms. There is always a solution like that, if you look for it. I can hardly blame you, students and others, for being sometimes confused as what is true about Rwanda or Africa. The manner in which you receive information and have it validated is designed to sow confusion and not build understanding. There is a culture of making up one's mind about Africa by simply borrowing assumptions, prejudices, and judgments from trusted intermediaries who, by the way, tend to look the same, as you may have noticed. Some points of view are seen as inherently balanced, neutral, factual, because of who says it and where. But in that process, many other voices are silenced. It is like being told you are a pity and have forgotten your place. Let me give you an example, a recent example. A Nobel Prize winner recently wrote that Paul Kagame effectively, in quotes, farms Rwandan children out to Western aid donors, allowing them to save our children's lives with health care in exchange for which criticism is suppressed. Well, first, no one is afraid of criticizing Rwanda, as we have seen. Second, implicit in that logic is the assumption that Africans are motivated by animal impulses lacking normal human feeling. I don't take this or his statement personally because he doesn't know me or Rwanda. He doesn't. He was just using us as a cardboard cutout for some generic type of bad African. It is as though the more we achieve in terms of outcomes, the more important it is to ensure that the Africans involved get no moral credit for it. 
significantly, not one participant in the online debate objected to this characterization. For centuries, the West has preferred to relate to Africa and the similar places from a position of moral superiority. There is a word for this, which I want to use to avoid unnecessary destruction. But let's agree that it reveals a stunning failure of moral imagination and human empathy apparently so profoundly embedded that it requires no further justification, even as it implicitly guides both foreign policy and higher education. The United States is known for adopting a morality-based approach to global affairs. This is deeply rooted in its history and culture, and it is, in fact, a positive attribute, and one which others are happy to join together with. The enduring a strong relationship between Rwanda and the United States, not only between our governments, but even more so our people, springs from the mutual recognition that we want the same things for ourselves and our planet, and are working in a good faith to deliver them. That helps cushion the friction that arise whenever actions are taken or statements made that implicitly deny what we share. But the defense of universal values must focus on substantive outcomes rather than on fundamentalism about process where clearly no one holds a monopoly of wisdom, as events have demonstrated. Imagine how much more we could do together, how much safer and more hopeful our world can be if we always relate to each other in a spirit of humility and mutual respect united against the many radical forces seeking to change the globe beyond all recognition. A major responsibility lies on young people, both in my country and here in this one, to resist easy superficiality get to know the world directly. Don't just read an op-ed or sign an online petition and assume that that is the end of the story. To read the world and make it better, you first have to understand it. Be as humble as you are curious, be contrarian where needed and ready where necessary to fight for what is right. But let's all remain open to having our views and understandings improved through a better comprehension of what others have endured and what they want for their future and what they can contribute. I thank you very much. <laughs>